Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. We're in a book of 1 Peter, chapter number 1, and verse number 10. And uh, we'll pick up, and because uh, I'm not too good at all that small talk stuff. So if you came to study and learn the Bible, then you came to the right place. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Why? For it is written, Be ye holy, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know, ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver or gold from the vain conversation, uh, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Father, Lord, please bless your word. I pray, God, you speak through me. I pray, Lord, that you would use me. I pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified and that uh, your scripture would be made clear to those who have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Of which salvation? Which salvation? the one that works which salvation the one that's of Jesus Christ that's not of works lest any man should boast which salvation the one that is not a denomination but it's a person that salvation of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you the Old Testament prophets have 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 shown all the way through i mean all the way from genesis down to malachi you will see jesus christ being prophesied the whole book is about him and our salvation is in there our salvation is so much in there that once the holy spirit came down and the 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 early church was illuminated and and gave the, the they had uh, received the spiritual understanding from the Holy Spirit they were able to take that Old Testament to people and give them Christ and show them Christ and lead people to Christ not even using a New Testament but using an Old Testament because on that Emmaus Road Jesus Christ made it plain to those disciples that were down you know what this whole book is about me and it takes the Holy Spirit to illuminate you and show you Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And you know, the prophets, they seen the suffering Savior and they tried to make sense of it, but they didn't understand it. They, they, all they could see was a great military leader that would take over the nations and would be king over the earth, but they did not see the servant Christ. If they seen him, they scratched their head at it. His humble beginnings and his death on the cross, numbered with transgressors. Uh, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They seen this, they, they prophesied of it, and they have inquired of it. They look deep. They study this matter out. You know, and that's the way we ought to be. We ought to study out a matter. It's it's part of your kingship. Kings like to study out a matter. And uh, if you don't really have any room in your heart for study, I wonder if you're really a king. God's made you a king. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired 
that means to ask questions about it's an inquiry and search diligently they didn't search lazily they didn't look at it and then not really give it another thought no they actually put in the time searching the scriptures trying to understand what they were prophesying of what they were reading what is this what is this this christ that is to come we know that he's going to make us the head of the nations we know that there's going to be a perfect kingdom that's to come and we're all for that we know he will overthrow our enemies and he will but they didn't see that first coming clearly they didn't understand that first coming that suffering savior the humble savior that savior who john the baptist said i am not even worthy to to take off his shoes his uh to unlatch his shoe latchet but yet that savior was taken off the shoes of his disciples and washing their feet they would inquire about that who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you not unto them grace was in the old testament even as far back as noah because noah found grace in the eyes of the lord you must understand that salvation has always been by grace through faith never was salvation by the works of the law that doesn't make any sense so you think Noah would find grace in the eyes of the Lord and he would just fall upon God's mercy and with a repentant heart come and seek after God and then he would find him because he looked at he looked for God with all his heart and all of a sudden what God thought it was too easy so now he's going to add the law to complicate things and make salvation harder to be obtained or to only be obtained by what? The Jews that were given the uh, covenant, were given the Old Testament, were given the commandments. So what, the Gentiles all went to hell because the Gentiles weren't able to observe the law except for those that would maybe come across the Jews and somehow end up in their camp and end up worshiping their God? Well, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe the Ruckman model of salvation this way and this dispensation and then another way oh this way it was by works and this way is by faith and works and then this way it's in completely by works in the millennial and you know there's so much stuff there's so much problems that has come from dispensationalism dispensationalism is a good thing we are to rightly divide the word of truth but I'm afraid that we chopped up the Bible and that we have uh, we've missed we've we we vastly misunderstood a lot of passages, and uh, we think we understand stuff pertaining to maybe the Jew in the tribulation or you know what? But because we are not in that time, and we have a specific dispensation that's given to us in the church age just like there was a specific dispensation given to the law and the prophets even though <laughs> we'll see this here let's let's look at verse 11 even though searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify these men that were prophets had the holy spirit of Christ in them and they're searching and they don't understand but yet we think that we understand everything about the tribulation or the millennial reign and God's dispensation towards them. Why? Because we got the Holy Spirit. We got the Holy Spirit of Christ. Well, they had the Holy Spirit of Christ. I'm not saying everybody did, but it, here it says that the prophets did. They had the Holy Spirit and yet the Holy Spirit would not reveal it to them. He would not illuminate them and give them the understanding, though they sought it diligently. I think there's a lot of doctrines, maybe even looking back sometimes, not just looking forward to the tribulation or millennial, but even looking back to the law or even the time of uh, um, innocence or whatever that we think we understand because we have the Holy Spirit which we probably do have quite a, a good amount of understanding concerning these things. But 
from what I see here, you can search diligently having the spirit of Christ and still never understand it. It takes God's revelation. And sometimes God will cut off everybody from that revelation. We don't, we don't read really of anybody that believed that Jesus Christ was going to die and was going to be buried and was going to rise again from the dead on the third day. The closest we have to it would be John the Baptist. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing in the Jordan River, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. How does a lamb take away sin? A lamb had to be slain and his blood had to be shed to be a temporary covering for sin. Well, if if John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God, would he not understand that Jesus came to die? I would imagine he did. But from what I see here, he may prophesy of something and call him a lamb and not even understand what he just said. We see that with, uh, I believe it was Ananias or it was Caiaphas in the book of Acts. He said, uh, was it the book of Acts or it could have been the book of John? It is necessary that a man should die for the, for the sins of the people. I believe he said it like that. And it said that the, the, he had some sort of uh, Holy Spirit speaking through him, but yet he didn't understand what he even said. Searching water, what manner of the time the Spirit of Christ, uh, which was in them, did signify? It, there were signs, signify. Signs, you know, this, this Old Testament was full of signs of his coming. Full of uh, pictures and types of what Christ would do. You know, but, but those Old Testament prophets couldn't look at Abraham in the offering up of his son Isaac, his only son, or his only begotten son. And the fact that he believed that he would raise him from the dead because it was a shadow of Christ and what was to come. They couldn't see that like we see that and say, oh, that's like Jesus Christ dying for our sins and rising again from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty amazing book we got here. And you can't know it through the intellect. You can't know it out of sincerity. You can't know it because you search diligently. If God chooses not to reveal a thing, he will not reveal it. If he chooses to reveal it, you can't boast anyways because it was God that revealed it. You don't know anything aside from the Holy Spirit of God. Who, who do you say that I am? Simon Barjona? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, what? Man, your Bible study revealed that to you. Your, your great knowledge and your great understanding and your intellect. He said, no, flesh and blood have not revealed that to you. Uh, there was no Pharisee that revealed that to you. No scribe. But God himself had to reveal it. And that's the way it is with anything that would ever stick anything that would ever we would ever gain knowledge of or understanding of that will actually be uh, causing us to change or to be more like Christ we have to get it through revelation searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ and then the nose is itching was in them to signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow so it testified, the word of God testified, the prophecies testified of the salvation that we would receive by grace and the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, that they would, that Jesus Christ would be glorified. And I believe they even saw that somehow a people would be glorified with him, but they didn't understand it. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Ministers who reported and, and preached the gospel. And we're not talking about Paul only. We're not talking about 
Paul and his gospel as if that's the only gospel. It's the only true gospel, but Paul's not the only one proclaiming that. There were ministers <laughs> unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, them that have preached the gospel. That's James. That's John. That's Peter. He's, he's preaching the gospel, talking about what Christ did for us, the good news that he paid our sin debt, that he suffered and bled and died, and that he rose again from the dead for our justification. And the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, and I'm sure they saw that and, and, and un, did not understand it. What? The Holy Ghost? They believed God as one. They believed in not the Godhead. They believed, but just God the Father. But it looks like God has a son. If you read Proverbs chapter number 30, Agar prophesied concerning the son who was involved in the creation, who ascended and descended. Huh. So, so we have prophecy concerning God having a son and him suffering for the sins of mankind. And we have prophecy of the Holy Ghost coming down and they didn't know anything of the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost would come upon people but I don't know if they understood what was happening to them I don't know if they understood that that's the third part of the Godhead because they're in the dark for the large part only thinking that there is a father and nothing else Though, if you look back as a Christian, you see the Trinity throughout the scriptures. You say, oh, the Trinity, oh, that's Catholic. Okay, if you want to sit there and, and fight over words and, and strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, it's the Godhead. You know, call it what you want, but the three persons of the Godhead, that's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, we like to complicate things sometimes. I think the Bible is pretty simple concerning that. Not to say I understand it, but it's simple in its explanation of it. Verse number 11, I want to look at some verses concerning searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Let's look at that. Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Most people know that, and the Jews avoid that. But this is probably the best verse, or excuse me, chapter to ever illuminate a person that's a Jew that has a right heart that wants to find the truth. Okay, now we're going to read it. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Well, not unto the prophets. Not unto the Jews. They didn't understand it. But we do. It was revealed to the saints, to the to ministers of the gospel, the early church, and to us. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. I'm glad that uh, refrigerator turned off. And now I'm going to be checking for the residual noise and uh, trying to silence that and all that. I got to fight with uh, cars and traffic going by on one side and a refrigerator that's noisy on the other. So if it happens to come out pretty quiet, then that's a miracle too. <laughs> For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we dis esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted, or and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and that all means all. 
not just the elect. He didn't have a limited atonement. You want to put limits on God? Calvinist? Brother? Uh, you know, okay. Believe what you want to believe. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Oh, but we sure open our mouth when we're afflicted, don't we? Or when we're oppressed. Not very Christ-like most of the time, are we? He is brought as a, as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And we've seen that in Pilate's judgment hall. Very little was said. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Well, how can you kill the Son of God? How can you kill God in the flesh? Can you see how maybe they would scratch their head? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Oh, we don't transgress. I mean, God don't ever, you know, we, we were never under bondage to any man. You know, like we're so perfect. And they ignore Egypt and they ignore uh, Assyrian captivity, Babylonian captivity, the captivity at times with the Philistines or any of the other Canaanite people. Oh, well, you first got to know you're a sinner. If you're ever going to get your sins forgiven, you got to know that you need your sins forgiven. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He never sinned one time. That's why he was a perfect lamb and a perfect sacrifice, substitutionary sacrifice. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. That's talking about God the Father seeing the travail of Jesus' soul. See the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquity. See, oh, it's just the elect he justifies. No, many as in he brings many sons to glory. Those, even though he's a savior of all men, especially those that believe. Many will believe. Many will be in heaven. Uh, John, the revelator, he saw a vision and he saw, he, he saw those in heaven. He said he saw many people up there of uh, every kindred and tongue and nation. Thousands upon thousands and thousands of thousands. That's many. But sad to say, the many that are up there, there's many, many more that end up where God never intended them to go. He shall see, I got a little white hair popping up here. And I, when I look down, I see it and it's distracting me. I'm easily distracted. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You say, well, see, there it goes again. He bare the sins of many, but it doesn't say everybody. So he didn't bear everybody's sins. Oh, he did, but he bare the sins of many. You know what? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. But you got to lay down and, and, and give him that burden, and he'll bear that burden for you. And he bears the sins of many. But some people, even after they say, like to bear their own sin. And uh, But many, they say, Lord, I'll just give it to you. Whenever I sin, I'll, I'll, whenever I start getting weighed down, I'll let you take that. So let's go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And we got some more references here. Let's look at Luke. Looks like Luke chapter 10 and verse 24. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, 
and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. So you know that everybody in the Old Testament was looking forward to the cross. And then we look back at the cross, not according to the scriptures. For many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And even even the saints that follow Jesus closely, his his 12 disciples, when he would tell them of the death, burial, and resurrection, they didn't even understand it. They didn't even receive it. But we receive it now, don't we? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 through 11. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. We well, say, I, I, I believe you could be saved and not go to church. Well, okay. But it's the church that God manifests the manifold wisdom of God and he uses the church to bring those things that are hidden in God out into plain sight. I would be involved in a local church if I were you. Okay, where were we? According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. He had an eternal purpose. God the Father planned it all out. God the Father, before the foundation of the world, he had Christ in mind and set Christ apart. He set the Word apart. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in the mind of God, that was the plan from the beginning. Before he ever created the world, before he ever created Adam and Eve, he said, this is how we're going to do it. Man is going to sin, man is going to fall, and we're going to redeem him through the perfect life of my son, who, who will be made manifest. God will be made manifest to men, and they will kill him. They will deliver him into evil hands and crucify him. And he will rise again from the dead on the third day. And uh, let's see here. Let's look at verse number 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost ought to cause you to preach the gospel. Not yourself not a health and wealth prosperity message but the gospel you know you can preach many things to the lost world and they're not going to receive it the only thing they're going to receive is you're a sinner Christ paid for your sins you can be justified today if you believe the gospel that's all they're going to get unto you the Holy Ghost uh, sent down from heaven uh, which things the angels desire to look into let's look at that um, first, let's look at John chapter number 1, verse 16 through 17. John chapter 1, 16 through 17. And of the fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The grace that came to us. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, not by the law. Okay, let's see here. I don't know if that was the greatest verse to use or if I maybe wrote something wrong there. Uh, let's look at Luke 24 and verse 49. I hate that sometimes when I do a study or I put these references down a long time ago and then I might have said something in a message I think that was originally from a message I preached maybe over a year ago at Pastor Nagowski's that note and uh, now I look at it and I'm not sure if the, what I meant by that so bear with me here Luke 24 and verse 49 
And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high, the power to preach the gospel. You can't go without the power. You can't go, you can if you want, but nothing will ever get done. It takes the power to be upon you. The Holy Spirit needs to come down. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And, you know, they had to wait for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to come upon them before they would go out and minister and preach the gospel. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are, are Christ have uh, crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of glo uh, vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So we are not to walk in the flesh now as saints. We are to walk in the spirit. And God gave us that Holy Spirit to walk in. And uh, those, those prophets, they didn't understand that. Most Christians, they don't understand it. Uh, let's look at verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And remember, the battle is in the mind. The battle goes on in the soul. That's where your mind, your uh, your knowledge, your understanding, that's where your uh, your will is present. That's where your emotions and God God will not try to cause you to live according to your emotions, but Satan will. Verse thirteen. Wherefore, because of all you what you just read, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, let's look at a few more verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. For I think that God have set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. For we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. And we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels. You're not made a spectacle unto the world and to angels if all you do is meet behind uh, the closed doors of the church. But if you get out there and publicly preach the gospel with the Holy Ghost that gives you power to do so, then the world, it says that's foolishness to the world and that you're like a spectacle to them. And the angels are watching too and you're a spectacle to them. Look at these men. They're sinners. They still sin. They're, they're, they're not holy like us angels. And yet they're going out there boldly proclaiming a gospel. And But, but look at how they run to their father every time they sin. Look at how they they don't want to cover their sins and and look at how God will give them power just like he did Samson after Samson's sin. And you think, well, God must be done with Samson, but he kept giving them power, didn't he? Yeah. And we sin too. We we are not sinless, but we should sin less. Let's look at uh Let's look at, uh, let me see here. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse 15 through 16. Hebrews 11. Fifteen through 16. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So he has children that, like, like Abraham, have been called out of the world, and they're looking for a heavenly city, 
And God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And remember, the appeal of mansions in heaven was to the already saved individuals or, or a group of saved people. It was not a ploy or it was not like the means of trying to win people to Christ as we use it. We, we use, don't you want to go to heaven? as a means of trying to get people to repeat a prayer or ask Christ in their heart. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? <laughs> Me and my brother were talking about it today, or my brother and I, and he was saying, like, you're going to try to talk to a little kid and tell a little kid, do you want to go to Disneyland this week? Well, you think they're going to say no? <laughs> you want to go to heaven when you die? What? I'm going to die? Yeah, and you want to go to heaven? Well, just ask Jesus in your heart, and then when you're done, wave to him. Oh, you don't like that, do you? Show me child evangelism in the Bible. Oh, but you're supposed to come as a little child. Yes, you are. As an adult, you're supposed to be made like a little child. You're supposed to let your pride go. You're supposed to come humbly and trust in the simplicity of the gospel. But little children they're not accountable. The little children, God didn't even hold accountable those that were uh, in the wilderness that were under 20 years of age. The only mention of the age of accountability, any kind of age of accountability was in the Old Testament. And those that were under 20 were not accountable where everybody else in Israel perished 40 years wandering in the desert. And you think that a four-year-old's getting tossed into hell, like left and right, little children that age? Because if a four-year-old can get saved, then the four-year-old can go to hell too and burn in hell like a sausage. That's stupid. You know, my brother said this one too. Like, you know, they just they just learn how to use the potty and then the next year they're dealing with their eternal soul. Like, <laughs> come on now. Playing while they're playing with their Tonka trucks and all that. If they still make Tonka trucks swinging their little wiffle bat and playing wiffle ball and God's ready to drop them off into the lake of fire for eternity. He'll put you in hell though. I guarantee you that. You're and and, and I won't, I won't say, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to bank on 20 years old." If you're a teenager and you understand you're a sinner, you better not rebel. You better come to the Lord as soon as you can. We won't put an age limit on it, but I'm telling you what, I, I believe that there's teenagers that get saved and, and really get saved and really mean it. And you got to understand too, and, and I like, I think it was Brother Matt that said this, if your little child can get saved, then your little child is going to get full of the Holy Ghost. Your little child is going to all of a sudden preach the gospel and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Your little child is going to start showing the fruit of the Spirit and we just read them. Love, patience, meekness, gentleness. And it, you better be looking for all those fruit. I mean, because I'm telling you, just because they ask Jesus in their heart and they're cute doesn't mean that they're born again. I don't know. Just a lot of kind of weird stuff. We're, we're, I've talked about it before, but we're kind of like Catholics. You know, the Catholic will baptize their baby because they don't want them to go to hell. And then, you know, the Calvinists will just believe that their children are part of the elect, so they're not going to hell. And then the Baptists will have them, you know, ask Jesus in their heart when they're three or four or five years old. Just preach the fear of the Lord to them. Tell them of the Savior. Tell them of Jesus Christ. Raise them in the fear of the Lord, and God will draw them. Don't don't push them into the door. You can you can tell them about Christ, and I'm telling you that sometimes the best thing you can do is back off and just allow God to work. And I, and I think that sometimes kids may ask the Lord in their heart, and that's a blessing. And I think that's a blessing. And you know what? That's that's like signifying or showing oftentimes good things to come. You know what? They're gonna more than likely come to the Lord if they're already curious about it and they're sitting there listening what a blessing that is you know what but don't lose sleep over your four-year-old as i said frying in hell like a sausage 
you want to go preach a four-year-old or a three-year-old's funeral and say, well, I never seen the fruit of the Spirit in them. Or they made a profession of faith when they were three and, you know, for two years after that, all I seen them is live like the devil, you know, and, and, and in hell, they lifted up their eyes. They went from, you know, playing in the sandbox to open it up their eyes in hell and, and flames. Well, I don't like that. I don't know. We 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 gotta be careful with what we see in this Bible. I'm telling you that he's called all men everywhere to repent. Men. I'm talking about those that know better. We're not talking about little children. Where, where do you see the disciples going off and 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 leading children to the Lord? Okay, went off on a little bit of a tangent there. Mm -hmm. Where am I at here? Okay, let's let's read a little further down. Verse fourteen: As obedient children, <gasps> children, we're called children, children of God, and the children of. Israel were delivered out of Egypt. Little kids or grown people? Were the little kids with them? Yeah, but when we're talking about children, John says little children. First John, second John, third John. Who's he talking about? He's talking about us, saved individuals. And the children that got tore up by those bears. Little, little children? Probably not. Because that, that gets people scratching their head too. That that reference there, I believe in Kings. Go up thou bald head and all of a sudden the bear comes running out and tears these children up. Never said it killed them. It said it tore them up. It tore, tore them. Okay. But as he which have called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be holy for I am holy let's look at that that's an Old Testament reference Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6 Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6 Not too sure I want to make any shorts out of uh, what I was talking about with those about children. <laughs> about children uh, getting saved and all that. That'll really, as my Uncle Kiki would say, click them off. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not see his love upon you. Is this it? Deuteronomy 7 6. Like I said, this, this could have been from a message that I preached and it, and it might not relate as much as I thought it would relate. For thou art a holy people. Okay, they're holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. They're set apart. Holy. Holy is set apart unto the Lord thy God set apart not for any specific reason but to God we are holy we're set apart for God's use we are bought with the price just like Israel was bought and purchased out of Egypt for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God the Lord thy God have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were the fewest of all people. But, be, but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto you, you and your fathers hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And you know what? We have been redeemed in like manner. But as he which have called you is holy, be ye holy. And and there is a scripture, and it, let me see if I can find it here. Um, 
Maybe it's Leviticus 11.44. I want to make sure you see that this is a scripture here in the Old Testament. Leviticus 11.44. For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Uh, for I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Okay. But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Verse 17. And if ye call on the Father who without respect to persons judgeth or according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Let's look at Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 15 through 16. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You see that it's important that we walk circumspectly and that we redeem the time. And that's something that I've been really convicted about. I'm trying more and more to redeem the time, make my time uh, valuable for God and his use and for uh, to, to bring others to Jesus Christ or to, to teach others to come closer to the Lord and their walk with him. And I want to redeem the time because we're, we're supposed to. We're supposed to fear, fear the Lord enough to, to not waste your life. Verse, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 9. Hebrews 11, verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. There's that same word, sojourn, talk about Abraham. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So we also look for that city and we are to walk as sojourners, not putting our roots down, not trying to make this our permanent dwelling. Though we will dwell and we will inherit the earth, but there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, and, and whatever beautiful place you think you got now, it's nothing compared to the mansion that you will have. So don't live for the temporary. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. We need to walk with, with heaven in mind. Walk with his kingdom in our mind. Walk with our sights fixed upon Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 2. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place, of the seventh day on this wise and the God, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest and I think there's a dual meaning to that I'm trying to understand it I, in, in light of the Christian we are to enter into his rest that's his spirit filled life going after the promises of God, obtaining them through spiritual warfare and in, in inhabiting the land or inhabiting, letting God inhabit our land or God, let God dwell in every part, in every crevice of us. And it also has a meaning to Israel. Israel was delivered from Egypt 
and without going into typology and saying well that was the world and then they got saved by the blood of the lamb and they entered into the wilderness let's just let's just say that he called a nation out and he called a nation to be holy he called a nation to be separate but the vast majority of that nation that came out of Egypt that generation died and they died in unbelief and they were to not they are not to enter into Canaan or they are not to enter that rest where they cease from their own works, which the Pharisees were trying to keep the law and, and try to earn and merit their salvation. But they would cease from their own works and that they would trust in Joshua or which is a type of Jesus Christ. They would trust, trust Jesus to get them there, to give them that rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor in a heavy laden and I will give you rest. But the nation would not come to God. They would not come to Jesus Christ. They rejected him. They remain in unbelief. And, and Hebrews is largely written to a, a, a Jew that is thinking that the Old Testament is better, but this is better. Jesus is better. His sacrifice is better. And uh, you don't want to fall short of that. You don't want to taste of that like those spies that went in and they tasted of the land, the, the land flowing with milk and honey, and they got those grapes and all that and came across, but yet they were afraid because of the giants. And there's going to be a lot of giants stand in your way as a Jew come into the Lord and, you know, the giant of your family or maybe being excommunicated from a synagogue or something. And there was a lot of early church people that had these giants in their way and they said, well, I won't believe, I won't come to Jesus Christ because unbelief they're they're afraid they're afraid what would happen to them their social status and uh we also ought not to neglect so great salvation we have salvation given to us but we ought to learn from the jews that wandered in the wilderness and unbelief and we need to believe the promises of god enough to apply them in our life and seek after them and and seek spiritual victory in our life Otherwise, we fall short of that, and God's not, his soul will have no pleasure in us. And uh, this has been approved unto God. Hard to believe, but uh, that's why we study, not for approval of men. And they, you'll never please men. If you want to be a man pleaser, you're never going to make it very far. But we're studying to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I ought to produce some work in you. And, and and it'll make you not ashamed. So why are you ashamed of him? Why are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you going to be ashamed at his coming? Not if you're studying. Not if you're working. Not if you got the judgment seat and focus. See you next time.